Hello everyone, my name is Joseph Dinesh, a Catholic commentator from Sydney, Australia. Today I would like to discuss the rise of the radical traditionalist Catholics, sometimes referred to as rat trads, and challenge some of the views propagated by them among their young Catholic followers. For those not acquainted with the movement, it involves individuals within the Catholic Church who identify as conservative and Catholic traditionalists, but more popularly recognized for questioning, resisting, and in certain instances, outright rejecting the documents of the Second Vatican Council. Today, I would like to bring to your attention some of the pitfalls of the traditionalist movement and why they should definitely listen to what Bishop Barron has to tell them. So let's address it one by one. The first obvious question to ask is whether as a faithful Catholic, can you be against an ecumenical council convened by the successor of Peter under his authority and approval? Let's listen to what Bishop Barron has to say. Well, a first observation is this. As a Catholic, you can't be opposed to an ecumenical council gathered, <laughs> as they say, cum petro et sub petro, right, with Peter and, and under Peter's authority. There's no higher authority in the life of the church than an ecumenical council gathered by the Pope and under his leadership and with his approval. And so it's just bad ecclesiology. It's just bad Catholicism to say, oh yeah, Vatican II, we should dispense with that. What you have heard from people today, with that view, I have zero patience. And I think no priest should have any patience with the view that we can somehow dispense with or you know, pick and choose what we like from a council. As I argued, why not do it with Chalcedon and Trent and, and uh, Vatican I? So I, I have zero patience with that. Bishop Barron's question really hits home because rejection of an authoritative ecumenical council based on what we like and don't like sets us on a slippery slope. Don't you agree? This bad precedent might motivate individuals even within the radical traditionalist movement to reject other councils like the Council of Trent or the Council of Nicaea simply because they disagree with certain aspects of it. It's like sawing off the branch you're sitting on. We can't pick and choose councils based on our private judgment. So the bottom line is, as a faithful Catholic, you can't reject the Second Vatican Council. In the second clip, Bishop Barron briefs us about the two logical fallacies that challenge the idea that the Second Vatican Council is solely responsible for all the issues facing the Catholic Church today. The perspective he shares is quite interesting, and honestly, it's the first time I'm catching wind of this. So let's listen right in. Well, let's get two problems, both in formal logic. One is the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy, right? Because it came after, it must be because of. And so there's that tendency to say, oh, well, these things happen after the council, therefore the council's to blame. That's a fantastic observation. Just because numerous liturgical abuses emerged after the Second Vatican Council does not necessarily imply direct responsibility on part of the council itself. It's plausible that individuals in various locations interpreted the council differently, leading to diverse practices and varying results. Perhaps that could be one of the contributing factors. In any case, if we are inclined to attribute blame to the Second Vatican Council, it becomes crucial to establish a direct causation between the council and the absurd abuses occurring globally. Now let's move on to the second logical fallacy that Bishop Barron talks about. It's called singular causality. Let's listen to him. The other logical problem is the fallacy of singular causality. So we can find one great cause for all the troubles we're having. You know, the decline in certain areas of church life in the West is a very complex phenomenon and is caused by all sorts of factors. Uh, a couple observations. One is, look at the church in Africa. Uh, the post-conciliar African Catholic Church is flourishing, is booming. And trust me, it's not based on a nostalgic return to the Latin Mass. I mean, I've been to Africa and seen African liturgies. Uh, to me, it's a beautiful example of the rich enculturation of the faith that Vatican II was about. Look at the church in parts of Asia where it's, it's flourishing. There is a kind of myopia of a lot of people in the West to say, well, you know, looking at our culture and our society, things look grim in certain ways. So I, I think you've got to get past that and accept a, a much richer account of how we, in our part of the world, got into our situation. The Catholic Church has faced a myriad of challenges such as abuses, corruption, and clericalism throughout its history. It seems somewhat simplistic to attribute all the issues we witness in our church today solely to the Second Vatican Council. Blaming the Second Vatican Council for everything is also indicative of the scapegoating mentality prevalent among human beings. 
just like the story of the adulterous woman where a group of people brought her to Jesus to make her the scapegoat of all their problems to the extent that they were willing to stone her to death but Jesus promptly shuts them down saying let the one who has not sinned throw the first stone he breaks the cycle of the scapegoating mentality of the people surrounding her but as i focus more and more on the rat trad movement it seems like they are doing a similar thing with the second vatican council labeling it as the scapegoat for all the problems of the church how can one council be responsible for all the problems it sounds unreasonable isn't it as long as the second vatican council takes the fall church leaders from both the clergy and the laity will evade accountability and not face any consequence for their actions In the final clip Bishop Barron openly acknowledges his frustration with the prevalent abuses and corruption within the Catholic Church. However, he emphasizes that laying blame on the Second Vatican Council is not the solution. Instead, he suggests a surgical analysis of the problems and finding suitable solutions. He uses the metaphor of burning what is necessary but cautions against burning down the entire house. Let's tune in and hear more. Am I angry? at McCarrick am I angry at the rot in the priesthood am I angry at the terrible abuse of authority that took place in way too many cases yes and am I going to wield a, a torch to try to burn that stuff down or burn it out yes or like a good surgeon to go in and cut that out what you don't want to become is a firebrand who takes the and I'm going to burn the whole house down and I'll be I'll go down with it or be such a ham-handed surgeon as I'm cutting out the the cancer I'm also destroying every organ in the body that's the trouble frankly with some of the rad trad crowd i think that yes they're angry i get it i'm angry too about these things but you don't burn the house down you you do you direct your anger appropriately and prudently so that you can you can excise what's problematic but that's why like an attack on the second vatican council that's burning the house down cuz you burn down second vatican council what's going to stop you from burning down the council of trent or the council of nicaea or chalcedon what's going to stop you as i said before you've adopted a fundamentally protestant ecclesiology and now i know you you think you're mr uber conservative catholic but you become a protestant effectively if you're saying my private judgment has authority over a council i can decide based on my own private whim what's acceptable or not in a council that's called burning the whole house down so don't burn the house down just burn the things that need <laughs> cleansing you know what i'm saying yeah. so that's my second harangue but i <laughs> well said by bishop baron refusing the authority of the second vatican council is comparable to setting the house on fire i genuinely hope and pray that those in the rat trad movement take heed of bishop baron's advice and address the issues of abuse and corruption in the church with surgical precision if they adopt this approach i'm confident that other catholics regardless of their association with the movement will join their cause and stand together in unity instead of following martin luther's path marked by opposition to the church Let's find inspiration in the lives of St Ignatius of Loyola and St Therese of Avila who passionately championed the cause of the church by reforming it from the inside. We are supposed to fight for the church, not fight against the church. God bless you.